time uh, stands still. It, this isn't your uh, first rodeo with Rush either. You've done many, many projects with these guys, right? I have. I, like, I started doing videos for them back, you know, 20 years ago. You know, it, it, um, it, we, we, we did three videos for them. We had a have a great relationship with them and uh you know we, we collaborating visually was awesome you know a lot of fun a lot of a lot of brainstorming coming up with ideas but you know that was a time when videos were being played and then of course mtv stopped playing videos and you know was only interested in sort of more pop mainstream so they stopped doing videos and um i guess about 12 years ago on their r30 tour they um Rush has always been a band that's had visual backdrops, and for their R30 tour, they um, they had done a, a, an animated montage to sort of open the show. But um, it, I think, Getty when when he saw it completed, he, he felt it was a bit too serious, so he wanted to introduce a a comedic ending for it. So uh, he he asked us to get together and had this idea that we should uh, have the animated ending be a, a, a dream. And the dream was um, the guy waking up from the dream was Jerry Stiller. So we went to New York and shot Jerry Stiller waking up out of a dream, and that sort of launched a whole new visual relationship with the band. And you know, ever since then, every tour. Um, me and Alan Weinberg would be involved with creating. You know the concept for the tour and the the visuals that go along with it, stage design. You know, so it's it's actually been we've been hanging out, you know, for a while. So uh, time stands still. Explain to me what the film was about. Well, the backdrop is the the, the last tour that they did. Um, the you know the R forty tour, um, and we had figured that we were you know we launched the tour in uh, April of two thousand and fifteen. We we knew that we were going to shoot the band live in Toronto in June, but we also knew that it was possibly the end, the last tour that they were going to do. So we were like, well, we we got to shoot this, and we got to do a documentary. So when it started, we weren't really sure what it was going to be, but we knew that it was going to be behind the scenes, uh, documenting what what goes on. But we didn't want it to be just sort of as it's referred to as scaffold porn, you know, shows going up, shows going down. Yeah. Um, we shot a bunch of interviews when we were in, in, in Tulsa, but we hired a, a field director, a guy named Miller, who had been out with them on the last tour and embedded them into the tour. So he was actually one of the crew, and he would actually trigger different visual things that would go on the screen. But he had cameras, and he would shoot them every day or every show with the mission of we wanted to get this sort of this behind-the-scenes kind of candid feel. But, but meanwhile, we wanted to cover the fans because... What we realized in talking about this is that this this band represents the end of an era. Forty forty years ago, they started. You know, when you put out records to um, you, you tour to sell records. Now you put out records to support a tour. So you know, it's gone completely one eighty. And um, so we wanted to really explore that whole idea of this band that's been doing it for forty years. How do you do that? You have a very loyal fan base. So we felt that the story could be a parallel track, 40 years on the road, 40-year fan base. Even if you only liked the band from 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, you need that loyal fan base. So the the, the doc is really about um, the band's 40-year career and the loyalty of their fans uh, who have supported them for the last four decades. So candid interviews with the band, behind-the-scenes stuff with the band, a handful of deep dives on fans, and then a whole bunch of random fans that are just super, super passionate. And you've got Paul Rudd involved. He's a big fan. How did you get him into the film? How much coercing did it take to get him involved? It actually didn't take much coercing at all. <laughs> I bet. And and it, it was interesting because when we were kicking around the idea of who should narrate this. We were, it was like, we got to get somebody that's important. we got to get somebody that's, you know, relative to the, relevant to the band. And, um, Paul's name came up early, but it was one of those things where we thought, oh, I don't know, you know, he, he's a friend of Getty's. He, you know, he was part of, uh, on the Time Machine tour, he, the, uh, him and Jason Siegel did the... Uh, I love you, man. Uh, the love you, man, <laughs> outtake thing for the closing on this current tour, on the R40 tour. Mm. We, we did a little thing where 
we had um, different celebrities do the rap section of Roll the Bones. Yeah. And and him and Jason did one that was just like made us pee our pants. It was so funny. So he's <laughs> always had this connection with the band. And then finally, you know, we did we did a we did a, a narration track in a studio. We put it to picture, and it was like, yeah, it's so it's good, but it's not quite right. So then it was finally, well, let's just ask Paul Rudd. <laughs> and um, I remember it vividly actually because we made this decision on a, like a Thursday. And Friday night, I'm out somewhere, and I get an email from her text from Alan, like 11:30 at night, going, "Oh my God, he said yes." <laughs> <laughs> and, we're, and we're like, "Woohoo!" And so the cool thing was, we booked a date. We did a voice pack with him. He was in New York, and we were in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And you know what? The guy is awesome. He is just got on the phone. We had you know some some laughs, and he talked about he saw the film. He thought it was great. He really really liked it. He was you know it was honored to be involved and happy that we asked him. And so we're kind of you know going, this is awesome. You know we talked a little bit about what the narration tone should be, mm-hmm. and and you know he does the very first you know narration block one and i'm like a goofball and i'm I'm going oh my god not to sound cheesy or anything but i love you man <laughs> and, and he giggles and then it, it just you know every time he would do a take it, it was it was perfect like he, the guy the guy is the regular guy that has the ability to to talk and you listen you know you he, he can be serious he can be comedic um it was it was we were thrilled we were totally thrilled that he said yes, and then and when he delivered, it was even better. Craziest, wildest, most passionate fans. Um, where did you find them, and how was it uh, talking to them? Well, there, you know, there, there's a there's a whole whack of them. Yeah. Um, I, I think that you know we featured three. We we deep dive on three of them in the in the film. There's a there's a there's a, a fan in the film that. Um, Actually, uh, he's from Scotland, and he was he was in a car accident, and he he was dead. He actually died in a car accident, and they brought him back to life, and he you know he recovered, but he used the music of Rush to help him recover, um, which was just one of those stories that you 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 latch onto and go, oh my God, that's the that's the power of belief, but it's the power of of, of lyric and music. You know, there there was fans that we talked to that have been to you know over two hundred shows. Um, you know, they're they're a, they're a very loyal fan base, and the interesting thing about them is they um, they when they see each other. In fact, um, one one of the fans in the in the film talks about being out for dinner and seeing someone walk into a restaurant with a fan t- a rush T shirt on. And she'll say, uh, you know, excuse me, but uh, I've got to go say hello to somebody I've never met. And, you know, the conversation unfolds because they've got Rush T-shirts on. It's, you know, how many shows you've been, what's your favorite album, all that kind of stuff. And it's just there's, they have this sort of loyalty to each, to each other. Um, you know, I think one of the things we realized in doing this, and it was really, you know, it was really felt in L.A., um, this fan base loves when the band tours. And, you know, lots of times a fan will go out and see 10 shows on a tour, e- even more. But but the L.A. show was like the representation of potentially the last time that they would get together as a, as a, as a, a Rush family and enjoy each other's company, um, you know, with the idea that the band, you know, probably isn't going to tour again. Wow. I can't wait to see this. Rush time stands still. When's it released? So it's in it's in like 500 theaters on November 3rd across North America. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like it's a it's a, a one night to one week run, mm-hmm. and then uh, I believe the actual DVD is being released on Black Friday, which I think is November 18th. Black Friday. So if you don't get to see it in the theater, it'll be out on DVD uh, a couple weeks after. I know you would highly recommend seeing it. On the big screen, big screen, big picture, big sound. I mean, that's that's the greatest place to see something like this. God, you have to experience seeing the film in a live audience in a in a theater with a live audience and have them react. Lots of times, what we do, it goes to TV, it goes to DVD, and you only get the reaction in the edit room. You never get the reaction of the live crowd. When it plays in Toronto, it's part of RushCon. It's going to be like five hundred 
fans in the crowd that will be reacting live, and it's a very different experience. Congratulations. Rush time stands still. Dale Heslip, thank you. Well, Robin, thanks for taking the time to listen to these crazy stories.